You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Giro d'Italia in association with Rafa. From Grand Tours to group rides, the Champs Elysees to coffee stops, Rafa exists to celebrate the world's most beautiful sport. Today, we are in Jerusalem. Cozze cittele, cozze, cozze piscine, non spiego de cicora, non spiego de cicora. Cozze cittele, cozze, cozze piscine, non spiego de cicora, se non mangiano le femmine. Put on me, Lionel. We're in Jerusalem, in the courtyard of the St. George's Pilgrim Guest House, where we are staying for a couple of nights before moving on to Tel Aviv tomorrow. We are, we are. We arrived late last night in Jerusalem. I should say that's Lionel Burney. My name is Richard Moore. We we will be your guides to the Giro d'Italia. <laughs> if you're tuning in for the first time, we'll be producing nightly episodes from the Giro d'Italia. This is number one. Daniel Freib is at the Tour de York at the moment. He'll be he'll be jetting in on on Monday to join the coverage. Um, but um, strange. Here we are, Giro d'Italia um, in in Israel, and we've been building up to this for a long time. Um, it's not been without its controversies, and we've talked a lot about these in, in the build-up to the race. Um, but we arrived, as I said, late last night. We we did a bit of a, a tourist thing this morning. We were able to, to walk into the old city and have a look around and cram in as much as we could, really, before the racing got underway. And there was a lot that happened in the racing. I should say that um, we're producing a special episode on Israel and Jerusalem, uh, the first of our Kilometre Zero episodes, which will come out Monday morning for Friends of the Podcast. Um, but we'll talk a bit about that later on in the episode, about our first impressions here and so on. There is a lot to talk about. It was a time trial, not a prologue, because it was a bit bit long for a prologue. And uh, quite a decisive victory by Tom de Moulin. But Lionel, give us the tale of the tapa, please. The, the inaugural tale of the tapa from the Giro. Yeah, well, we the race picked up where it left off last year with Tom de Moulin in the pink jersey again. The defending champion won the opening stage in Jerusalem. Uh, by just two seconds from BMC Racing's Rowan Dennis. Rowan Dennis, the Australian time trial champion, had looked like he might, uh, well, he might complete the set of all three Grand Tour leaders' jerseys, having won the opening stage of the Tour de France in 2015, having taken the red jersey when BMC won the Vuelta's team time trial in Nîmes last year. He was looking to complete the set. He came oh so close, but Tom de Moulin uh, pipped him by two seconds. There was a little scare for Dennis early on when Lotto Sudal, Lotto Fix All they're called for this Giro, they've got Sudal, one of the co-sponsors is, uh, well they're, they're called Fix All, it's, a, it's some kind of um, some kind of uh, grout and, and stuff that you stick tiles on the wall with and glues and that kind of thing, um, yeah important stuff Rich, <laughs> raising oh. your eyebrow but Victor Campanets um, went very close to beating Rowan Dennis's time um, but it was de Moulin who finished on top of the leaderboard the other big news today was that Chris Froome crashed in his warm up ride, um, a slowish crash on a corner um, but he was sort of scuffed up and bruised and uh, it obviously compromised his performance a bit because he was down in 21st place 37 seconds conceded to de Moulin already of the other GC riders well the m- most outstanding ride of the day I would say was Simon Yates of Mitchell and Scott, not a noted time trialist, but good in these kind of efforts, um, better than perhaps people think. Certainly, uh, I think we covered that in the in the last podcast. Yeah, in fact. Uh, what, uh, conceded only twenty seconds to De Moulin. Domenico Pozzovivo was tenth at twenty seven seconds, and then of the other GC riders, Thibaut Pino lost thirty three seconds, Esteban Chavez forty six seconds, Fabio Aru fifty seconds, Miguel Angel Lopez fifty six seconds. That's the Astana leader. He also crashed in the warm up, as did Bahrain Merida's Constantin Siutsu, um, and he crashed so badly, fractured a vertebrae, and is out of the race already so Bahrain already down to seven bone. riders vertebrae I think from oh. the communique at the uh, at the finish he but did he did a Matt White didn't he Matt White did that at the Tour de France one year and they were able to call him a replacement not so easy when the race starts in Jerusalem so um, so he's out and, and Bahrain down down to seven riders Victor Campenarts was it not at the Giro last year that he used the time trial to um, convey a, a message of love he proposed to his girlfriend, didn't he? He asked the girl. He asked someone out. Oh, did he ask them out? That's right. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, he's since moved teams, and and <laughs> a far more effective way of uh, impressing uh, a female, I would have thought, finishing second, third in the time trial. Um, but what do I know? Uh, 
<laughs> anyway, the Moulin, obviously, the, the story of the day. Um, and, uh, I mean, he looked very impressive in his uh, rainbow jersey as world time trial champion. And really, you know, he did look very smooth. And everybody had sort of, I think, assumed that Dennis was going to hold on and win, win the time trial. It looked, it looked a, a done deal. I think because the, the course was quite technical and we thought that guys with GC ambitions might might just um, hold off sufficiently on the corners and so on uh, that it might it might tilt it for Dennis but I asked uh, Dumoulin about that in the press conference actually and he 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 kind of batted the question away said that if you take a good corner then you know that it wasn't dangerous it was only dangerous if you didn't take the corners well is basically what he said um, which is a bit of a well, it's 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 easy to go fast when you stay upright, and that's what it's all about, isn't it? I mean, that's why uh, you know it's about judgment as well as speed, and uh, and he's he's got the lot, and uh, you know he him and the Giro, Tom de Moulin and the Giro, really is a. a uh, a love affair isn't it this is the third year in a row that he's worn the pink jersey two years ago he won the opening time trial in Apple Dawn um, then he got sick and lost quite a bit of time he stuck around in the race hoping that he would win the time trial in Chianti uh, but had a disappointing result there and then pulled out of the race uh, last year of course it was a time trial that, that's put the seal on everything for him he was dominant at Montefalco um, more or less held the pink jersey all the way to the end apart from um, the unfortunate number two gate where he had to stop to uh, stop to uh, answer the, the the most inconvenient call of nature uh, lost the pink jersey but regained it in the final time trial in Milan um, he actually held on to the pink jersey the day of he held on to it, didn't he yes. yeah and he, then, he only lost it a couple of days before Milan but the point is that the race was incredibly close you know going into the mm. time trial Milan four riders could still win it and those margins you know that's how Grand Tours tend to be won these days and he's put a lot of time into quite a few good riders here it, absolutely I mean it, we say it all the time don't we that you, you can't win the race on the first day but if you can take as much as half a minute out of some major rivals uh, all the climbers um, that is a huge bonus. I mean, he was asked also in the press conference whether he has any thoughts about holding the pink jersey from start to finish. I mean, very unlikely um, that that would be possible anyway. Um, but he, he also said that the team are not gearing up for that at all. They'll they'll let the jersey go, at, I guess, at a point when, um, when they can, because they don't want to have to defend it all the way, uh, particularly through Sicily and then the tri- tricky stages in the Apennines. And then, you know, that there's a lot of tricky stages before you get to the proper climbing stages. So he's in a great position. He's ahead of all of his rivals, but he doesn't need to be ahead of absolutely everybody in the race. Um, well, speaking of his teammates, I spoke to Sam Oman at the finish. Sam Oman is a young rider who uh, started the Vuelta last year, was riding extremely well, but got sick and had to pull out. Uh, he's very, very promising and uh, very highly thought of. He is, I guess he'll be de Moulin's number two, if I can use that expression. <laughs> In the mountains, oh, yeah. Moulin's number two in the mountains. Uh, un- unfortunate connotations, but um, he will be Moulin's number two in the mountains. Um, of Stop course, saying last it. year, of course, his his initial number two in the mountains, Wilco Kelderman, crashed out early in the race, and we forget that that De Moulin. Mm. We talk we talked a lot last year about De Moulin's team not being that strong, but we kind of overlooked the fact that he'd lost his most his strongest teammate. Yeah, that was on the stage to Blockhouse, wasn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, and 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 really, it was a. It was a pretty inexperienced-looking Sunweb team last year, wasn't it? I mean, uh, this year, having Sam Ooman, you know, ta- clearly a talent, clearly a good climber, um, could well be uh, absolutely vital for him as, as the race goes on. But let's hear what he had to say after the finish. Big, big performance there by Tom. Are you yeah. surprised to see how, how well he rode there? Actually, he had a hard beginning of the season, so in that case... Yeah, we didn't really know what to expect, but for sure he's world, world, yeah, he's world champion time trial and a pro look like this, twisty, up and down, that suits him really well. So um, I'm just really happy for him, yeah. And uh, it was a technical course, wasn't it? So dangerous, we saw that in the warm-ups and places, I guess. For him, the stakes <laughs> were quite high because his, his main aim here is to try and win the race overall. Yeah, that's true, but uh, I think if you can start with a victory... That's already a big boost also for the confidence. So in that case, it's also really contributing to aim for the for the overall uh, for the overall GC. So uh, and I think uh, he saw a course which suited him really well, and he took 
yeah, he immediately took the shot. 37 seconds on Chris Froome already. Yeah. Um, what about you? You've got a big job to do in this Giro as well, haven't you? Uh, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> uh, you rode, you were riding extremely well at the Vuelta last year before I think you fell ill, didn't you? So um, you'd be keen to uh, obviously get get through this Giro better than you did at the Vuelta. Yeah, in the first place I hope to, to reach Rome without any trouble and without any bad luck. And uh, I, I hope to be uh, really a big help for Tom in the mountains because uh, it's going to be a big battle for sure. Good luck. Thank you. A San Francisco. A community around the world. Stories and films with the most compelling characters. The world's finest apparel. Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Thank you very much to our main sponsor, Rafa. They, their support enables us to be here covering the Giro d'Italia, as we will be at all three Grand Tours, of course. We will, yeah, and uh, Rafa are selling our Pedaler de Charme jerseys and t-shirts and caps, aren't they? Um, Rafa.cc is the Rafa website, or alternatively, you can go to the cyclingpodcast.com forward slash shop and see the uh, the range of st- stuff we've got available. Pedaler de Charme jersey in a, a, a lovely light blue. Um, Pedalers de Charme, de Charme well. t-shirts, Pedaler de Charme caps. Um, all available for anyone who wants one. And we will be awarding Peddler de Charme to riders here at the Giro, one a week. So the first one will be towards the end of the first week. We'll Around midweek we'll be look, asking for nominations, but keep your eyes out for any charming peddling. Yep, charming peddling. Any um, contenders today? <laughs> There's a tough one. Oh, I saw a lot of, a lot of peddling. But I, nothing stuck. Nothing stood out to me today on the charming front. It's got to be. This is the thing. It, it, it's got to be something slightly offbeat. Tell you slightly what, off piece. Tell you what I did notice around Jerusalem, and in the old city, there are a lot of signs saying no electric bikes, which was kind of quirky the first time we saw it. But in Jerusalem itself, and it is a hilly place, but everyone's on an electric bike. I mean, not the. I should point out, not the, <laughs> not, not the, the riders. riders in the race, <laughs> um, but the normal punters uh, people just going around on on elect- quite high powered electric bikes wow they're popular here I've not noticed just, that either yeah just a little observation really? I made and um, we heard before the little break there from Sam Oman young rider on team somewhere and speaking to the team uh, Louis Vervec is another one who's very highly rated and they're expecting great things from they've got a you know they've got some some experience on the team. Lawrence Ten Dam, Chad Chad Haga now is quite experienced as well. Roy Curvers on the the flat stages, young Australian Chris Hamilton as well. But they've got four under twenty fives in their team, which makes them one of the youngest teams. I don't think there's another team with as many. There isn't there isn't another team with as many young riders on it, and that's the team of the defending champion. One other little thing from Dumoulin's press conference, or two other things, um, he. He said that he was wearing the pink jersey over the World Championships jer- mm. World Champions jersey, and he described those as the two most important jerseys in cycling. Controversial. Well, I mean, uh, I said it was a love affair between De Moulin and the Giro, and clearly it is. I mean, you know, buttering up. He got a he got a, a wry smile there, didn't it? Or not a wry smile, quite a satisfied smile from Manolo, the the press chief of the Giro, uh, who was sitting on the top table in the press conference. It was a beautifully delivered line. He unzipped his pink jersey to show the rainbow bands, and uh, well. I mean, it'd be interesting. He's a bit of a charmer, though, isn't yeah, he, De Moulin? Getting everybody on side early on. Yeah. Um, so he started the, the Giro very well. I was interested as well to hear him mention that he had gone out and, and taken in some of the sights and sounds of Jerusalem. We were curious to know how many riders, um, you know, a lot of riders, frankly, could be anywhere, I think. They, 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 they fly in and they live in a hotel room and they race and and they could be anywhere. So how many of them have actually lifted their heads up and had a look around? And some of them have. Um, Mm. Ben King has been out wandering around the old city, um, Dimension Data Rider. Tom Dumoulin, the night he arrived, um, went off on his bike in his normal clothes into the old city and rode around and up and down steps and so on. Um, Apparently. 
and uh, yeah, that's, that was quite interesting. We're going to tomorrow ask you, ask around a bit more and see if any other riders um, did the tourist thing while they've been here. Uh, but the other big story today, of course, was Chris Froome, uh, who crashed. Now, it was reported that he crashed once, and there's footage of him crashing once. One or two people said that he actually crashed twice. The team denied that. Um, but some people seemed convinced that he'd crashed twice. He was pretty bashed up. It, it looked it looked sore. He was pedalling smoothly enough, but um, with all these things, it's how he sleeps and recovers. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he didn't look... He didn't look thrilled at the finish. I mean, it's not just a time loss, but but falling off, you know, within a, what an hour or so, an hour and a half or so of uh, your first big objective of the season, uh, far from an ideal start. 2013 echoes of 2013 in Corsica, where he fell off in the neutralised zone, went he, on to win that tour, of course. Yeah, well, Nicola Portal, Sky Sports Director, mentioned that. Uh, let's hear from um, Nico Portal and then a little bit from Chris Froome. Yeah, I mean it could be worse. So he can, you know, we can see on the on the GT he can push hard. Uh, probably not at his best, but I don't know. If, but I don't know if you will win the, the TT. I'm not sure about that. I think uh, I'm. We are happy with the situation. I remember the first time we did it together in 13. He crashed on a neutral in Corsica, <laughs> pretty badly. And you know, I mean, yeah, it's part it's part of the of the um, the job. We said. Uh, but obviously, yeah, before the, the time trial, and then at the end of day one, it's not an easy one mentally to, to manage, but he, he's a tough guy and uh, he knows it can happen, so I think he was ready. Straight away, said Nico, all good, so uh, so boom, we're back on the business and uh, we carry on. You know, you've been, guys, you've been on the Prince Conference and there's been a lot of questions about this more than, than um, on, the, on the cycling side, on the sporting side, so for sure. I don't know how much this works on his body is, uh, but he's a really hard, hard man, you know. <laughs> And the mental is unbelievable, and uh, we we here to race, and now you know uh, just place to the racing, and uh, yeah, I think we we all we already we already so now we just we don't we don't even think about it. we just go for gas. Right, I'm just grateful it wasn't uh, it wasn't more serious. I mean, uh, a few guys came down today, and uh, some were pretty badly injured. So just just grateful it wasn't more serious. I mean, a crash is always going to hurt for sure. It's it's <laughs> it's not ideal to race just after having crashed, but. Uh, that's, that's bike racing and it's all part of the sport. I was probably braking around the corner and turning at the same time and the front wheel went. Well, Nicola Portal and Chris Froome there putting a brave face on things. Um, Friday evening here in Jerusalem, the call to prayer, is that? Well, we just paused there for the Muslim call to prayer from the mosque, just... Uh, just down the road there and I think you got a sense there of the deflation in Chris Froome's voice um, quite impressed really that he spoke at all really this evening he, he warmed down for a fairly long time you know it's difficult to say that his Giro is over because it's not at that time could be made up but it's never good to start on the back foot quite so solidly on the back foot is it not against someone like Tom de Mula as well but also I, I just have it. There's a sense around Froome of it being a bit like 2014 when, you know, he was defending his Tour de France title and he, he crashed a couple of times and and crashes never seem like just pure coincidence. They they, they always there always seems to be a, a, a you know a reason for it if you like um, and 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 you know I I think that that Froome. Uh, needed everything to go right here. Uh, he's got a very, very strong team, but a strong team is is worthless if you're not strong enough yourself to go toe to toe with with De Mula, with Pino, with these other guys. Well, one of the things about Froome is not just his physical resilience, but his mental robustness. You know, um, but the last 24 hours or so won't have, won't have been easy for him because. The pre-race press conferences, um, the issue of the ongoing. Uh, unresolved salbutamol adverse analytical finding from last year's Vuelta it's still hanging over him and the team um, you know some Mauro Veni was asked in a press conference uh, for his um, a take on things particularly when 
because it emerged that Froome and Team Sky knew that there had been this adverse analytical finding from the Vuelta at the time that they were negotiating the, the, the detail and particularly the financial detail of Froome's participation here. And then he was asked whether he felt let down, betrayed. and he Deceived. Said, deceived. Deceived, yeah. And he said he did feel deceived. And so to have the race director say that on the eve of the race um, and also say that, you know, um, he'd been assured by the UCI or by David Lepation that um, Froome would not be stripped of the result um, if the adverse analytical finding case is upheld and goes against Froome, would he be stripped of the Giro result? That's the great, you know, well, we don't know one way or the other, but Le Partion is saying that that's, you know, he made no such guarantees and there are no such guarantees. And so the whole thing is really, it's, it's really cloudy at the moment. And if it's cloudy for us, for the viewers watching, um, for Team Sky and Chris Froome, I don't care how mo- mentally strong you are. If that is occupying even 5% of your brain space, it must have an effect. It's shambolic, isn't it? And, I mean, then you said that La Partion had assured him that, that, that if Froome did win the Giro, that, that title would... It wouldn't be a Contador situation, which we had in 2011 when Contador won the Giro and then was subsequently stripped of it for a, a, a doping case that, that was was a, a you know pre-existing doping case. Um uh, it wouldn't surprise me if Le Partion did offer that assurance because we've seen with Le Partion, he does have a bit of a loose tongue, it would appear. The you UCI, mean saying, you saying what he thinks people want to hear well, in any given you, circumstance? Well, the UCI would then put out a statement saying that, you know, it's not up to him mm. to decide. Now, with with an adverse analytical finding as opposed to a prohibited substance, there is a possibility that a ban would start, if Froome is to be banned, that a ban would start after the Giro and, yeah. and all these races between the Vuelta and now would, would be okay in terms yeah. of the results standing. So he would keep his, I don't know, 20th place at the Ruta del Sol or, or whatever it was. But, um, you know, the, the Le Partion is not really, in a, he, he can't dictate that. It has no. to go through the proper channels and procedures obviously yeah it's one of the, it's ironic isn't it i mean uh, when brian cookson was the uci president you know everyone suspected that cookson was involved in and and influencing anti-doping policy and really the president's role is not to do that now we have la partion and he seems publicly at least to want to have that influence and and uh, shape the way that these things are going um so it's i have sympathy for for Vigny because the negotiations were um you know they were undertaken in good faith not you know Chris Froome had just won the tour and the Vuelta back to back you know there's why wouldn't Venny want Chris Froome in the race but of course he wasn't in full possession of the facts but I can also see Team Sky's point of view because this whole process had it been another rider had it not been leaked could very well have just been ongoing behind closed doors um, with complete anonymity and w- without this being played out in the, in the public domain but it's not worked out like that and so we are left with a, a, a bit of a pickle um, and in some ways you know having Chris Froome sort of you know his GC hopes compromised on day one you know it might simplify things when uh, you know when the, the Giro come to reflect on what sort of race that they, they've got in their hands on uh, you know the mountain stages in the second third weeks The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Independent research shows 10% of sports nutrition products which get a professional rider banned. Trust Science in Sport, the world's highest standard of pan substance testing. Thank you to Science in Sport for their sponsorship of the Cycling Podcast. They are also offering you, the listener, 25% off all your Science in Sport products at scienceofsport.com if you enter the code SISCP25 SISCP25 thank you again to Science of Sport uh, now a couple of other well a few odds and ends from the day Lionel um, a couple of talking points were the performance of Simon Yates and the near miss for Rohan Dennis mm. you spoke at the finish to Dennis's sports director Max Chandry yeah well Max we spoke to Max on the podcast a week or so ago um, after BMC Racing's um, owner and uh, biggest benefactor and biggest supporter Andy Reese had died um, and Max had been talking about how a, a victory um, you know they were they would like to bring in a victory um, to pay tribute to Andy Reese and the contribution he made to the team. Um, Max, after we'd recorded, he 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 said that he had uh, you know given a bit of a talk um, that win something for uh, Andy and um, the time trial 
was was the most obvious one. I mean, if you look at the roster, Rowan Dennis is is by far the most accomplished rider in the team. Um, and everything was looking so good. And uh, I waited at the, at the BMC tent up at the finish there for the car to come back. And Max and Marco Pinotti, who is the time trial coach for BMC, they were sat, they looked pretty bereft, actually, just sat staring into space, uh, not talking to one another. Um, initially sort of waved away my approach, but Max did then get out of the car. And uh, here is what he said. No, really, no real words. Uh kind of just analyzing in our heads now you know where we could have gained a couple seconds maybe some corners one corner but I think he did a, he did a, he did a fantastic uh, TT run uh, he gave it everything the plan was good he executed it good you know I mean Dumoulin won so I mean he got won the Giro last guy guys will win time trials win Grand Tours so yeah nothing really you can say did the fact that a couple of riders fell in warm up change anything at all from the recon ride no no, no. wrong just kept this standard but what we usually do is started uh, we looked at wind you know obviously the weather forecast we look at uh, gave us like uh, not so much wind uh, when we started and a little bit more wind later on we kind of planned out yes and no as, as we predicted uh, we kept everything the same we did three laps this morning went out pretty early well you know just we kept it we kept it to standard uh, so I think everything was done perfect on our side when Campanet got so close did you then know uh, it's de Moulin or, or Dennis now yeah yeah for sure we knew the last uh, last plot of guys were going to be the most important in, uh, in uh, winning and losing uh, race reader was, was wasn't not much on on the other side especially on the split side uh, so yeah it's just you know we're just fingers crossed really what could we do and just lastly I mean this would have been obviously a fantastic victory after uh, Andy Reese passed away wouldn't it yeah I mean it was uh, uh, obviously it was my phase one I'd say in the, in the whole process to this Giro was trying to get this jersey and and the plan and the dream was to bring it to Italy you know so we had two stages here but you know so we're just talking about things what well, did not happen <laughs> would I'd love to happen uh, I would love to have that jersey and honor Andy's dreams and uh, wishes to be one of the best teams in the world and be up there but it didn't happen but you know we're at the start so you know we have to move on we're looking at tomorrow we have a long year in front of us a lot of good stages we have some good riders so we're up there so BMC's dream of winning the pink jersey today and taking it back to Italy, um, well, Tom de Moulin had plenty to say about that. Um, unlikely that Rowan Dennis is going to be able to unseat de Moulin in the next couple of days, I would have said, looking at the um, looking at the course. It's going to be pretty sprintery the next couple of days. It is. Um, funnily enough, I was. It was, it was a funny old start to the time trial today that it, it was basically out the start house and straight up a hill mm. it was it was really hard looking and the riders look, were quite slow really you know because it was tough it was a sticky old road and one of these deceptive climbs that just kind of goes on um, doesn't look particularly steep but just sort of soaks up the effort uh, and I was standing with the Education First team and Joe Dombrowski was there and a rider came rocketing towards us and and uh, Dombrowski said, this guy's going to smash it. And I, I said, who is he? He says, I don't know, but he rides for quick step. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a fair assumption. It was actually Elia Viviani. <laughs> and he did look like he was going very fast. Um, and I didn't actually look up his time. Lionel, maybe you can uh, look that up for me while I'm talking. But um, he's somebody who I expect we will see in the next uh, in the next couple of days. And, you know, perhaps could he's, he could be somebody to unseat Tom de Moulin, that would that would obviously suit de Moulin. Oh well, Elia Viviani was 120 second, <laughs> one minute 17. So if he was smashing it on the yeah. climb, maybe he paid for that. He effort. he looked very very good over the first 400 meters. <laughs> but even with the time bonuses of 10, 6, and four seconds, it's going to take him quite a few days. <laughs> if, he wins, to, if he wins the first seven stages or so, yeah, he's got to win on Etna stages. then, hasn't he? That's not going to happen. Yeah, it's um, unlikely, isn't it, <laughs> that he's going to be in the pink jersey? <laughs> Um, anyway, that was uh, just uh, an impression that we had. The other, uh, the other big talking point, I suppose, from uh, the top ten was uh, Simon Yates. 
who put in a, a very good uh, time trial. Well, in fact, the time trial of his life, according to his sports director, Matt White, who I spoke to at the finish. I mean, we, we said Sam Yates, he, he can do a good time trial, but that was pretty exceptional today, was it not? Definitely. That's probably the best time trial he's done in his career. So to be top 10, uh, it, it certainly exceeded our expectations. We said before, once we actually could see the course, we knew it was a course that's uh, it's a very good bike handler. Mm. And because of the constant change of speed and the amount of uphill, uh, it's a time trial that suited him. And he took some good risks, uh, well calculated, and it's a nice start. Did you follow him in the car? I did. I mean, when you saw those risks, did you sort of... In- no, because the one corner that we that uh, one of our teammates, Jack Haig, crashed on, he did, didn't did risk on that one. But the other corners, he a very good bike handler, and he took calculated risks. So. The big question is always, what, what do these tell us? I mean, about his condition, about his form. Nothing that we haven't seen already this year, that he's, he's in a good place. He's in a good place. We're not going to see the first real test of the GC guys until we get to Sicily but it's always nice to take time on guys uh, and we haven't lost too much on anybody so it's a really good start It feels like the Giro is you know finally here when you hear from Matt White doesn't it? Look he I asked him if they've still got the toilet roll in the car and they have we're going to go and, and, and actually is that uh, is that story in the public domain yet yeah I think it is is it in the Friends special from last year it's in the Friends special with Matt from White from this year mm. ah from Matt White of mm. course it is yeah look it's lunch with Matt White yeah uh, part of the Friends of the podcast so if you're a friend of the podcast you'll get the significance of that story and if you're not sign up <laughs> to find out <laughs> the cyclingpodcast.com forward slash friends yeah we will be um, releasing Kilometer Zero Mondays Wednesdays and Fridays throughout the Giro start this coming Monday um, for friends of the podcast only at thecyclingpodcast.com £15 for a whole year of exclusive content and the first episode will be our impressions of the three days in Israel um, we've had our first day here first day in a bit um, what, what surprised you most Lionel? well I, it, that's a very difficult question because uh, what were my preconceptions I wasn't really I'm not really sure what I was expecting but the the walk through the old city was mind-blowing really um uh, not what i was expecting at all we went in via the damascus gate um entered into the the muslim quarter there's also a jewish quarter uh, a, an armenian quarter and a christian quarter um we went through the little security uh, checkpoint to get into the Jewish quarter went up to the Western Wall, um, watched as people were were praying, um, and really my what I in the space of about quarter of an hour we saw because it's Friday and apparently this is a ritual on a Friday the Christians carry a cross on the journey that Jesus Christ um, took the cross on uh, you know his final journey um, and we we went into the the church where he was you know put on the cross and where he was resurrected if you uh, you know if that's that's what you believe i mean i had this is where for me it was a real eye opener because i have no religion whatsoever the, the church not, was built later the church was clarified. built later yeah but on the site of yeah. on the site of the crucifixion and oh, obviously um and there was one moment where we stopped and there's a sort of a grate and you look down about 8 feet maybe 10 feet to the, I guess, original or one of the very early um, walkways from the second or second to sixth century, it says. And I was talking to somebody a bit later on uh, when, when we were watching the um, time trial and basically brought home to me that Jerusalem, you know, it's been kind of built on and built on and built on. It's been destroyed and built on by somebody else and then destroyed and built on by somebody else. And, um, and three of the major religions all share this space so you can stand in the in the jewish quarter and see the the huge and impressive gold dome of the mosque and just you know two minutes walk up the uh, behind you is is you know is a, a place of christian pilgrimage and it it wasn't what i was, I was expecting at all and i have to be honest it wasn't on my list of places to come and visit but i'm very glad that i've um, walked around and it uh, just brought home to me that uh, all of the kind of the, the reading at home, trying to prepare myself for, you know, being here in Israel and understanding a bit of the history, the politics and the religion of it. I mean, I don't think I could, uh, you know, I don't think I could have prepared myself for uh, for it. I mean, there's there's so much. 
It well, just brought we, home to me how how little I understand. Yeah, we, we, we've met a couple, some of the local people today. A couple of uh, listeners to the podcast actually got in touch and offered to, to help us and, and guide us around Jerusalem. And we've spoken to them. You'll hear from them in this first episode of Kilometer Zero. Uh, very interesting to get their perspective on, on living here, on life here. And um, I think what, you know, that in the old city itself, it is... It's pretty frenetic and there's lots of people, lots of tourists and, and lots of people from these different faiths and, and religions. And, and it all, it's all, it's quite chaotic, but quite peaceful. And yet every so often there'd be a, a little space carved out for armed police. Um, and, and that was quite jarring, really, to walk around the corner and see uh, su- such a heavily armed you know, presence of, of police. I was actually surprised that at the stage itself how light the security was. There was a, a checkpoint on the way into the race area, but it was very, very uh, sort of token, a glance in a bag, and 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 then you were into that bubble. Um, and you know, on the course itself, there didn't seem to be much security at all in terms of police, army, and so on. It, it, it all seemed... Well, yeah, but the, the flip side to that would be that people would say, well, the security is being deployed at the at the the borders isn't mm-hmm. it at the you know the border with the west bank um which we will go and see before we head off from jerusalem tomorrow we will anyway lots more to talk about in in relation to that and 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 our stay here and and what some of the riders think of it as well um we're introducing a new a newish feature we did sort of trial this a couple of weeks ago but we've got a number now that you can call and leave a message and some of these messages we will play in the podcast we've got our first one to play tonight from uh, Stephen Tunstall we'll hear from him in a moment but the number to call uh, it, well it's not a number to call you just leave a, a WhatsApp that's what we want a WhatsApp voice memo is what we want um, don't call us no one will answer the number is plus four four seven nine seven one three three eight two oh five that's plus four four seven nine seven one three three eight two oh five and if you go to, on the bottom right of the screen there's a little icon of a microphone press on that hold to record release to send and send us your little voice memo here is uh, someone who's here in jerusalem and has been here all week stephen tunstall hi cycling podcast this is stephen tunstall brackets friend of the podcast close brackets i'm just calling in from down the road from you in jerusalem i'm in jericho and uh, it's literally down the road it's 250 meters below sea level despite this being a 20 minute uh, drive away and uh, i'm here with a group of cyclists who have uh, yesterday cycled across from tel aviv through the west bank and took this really dramatic descent down into jericho down into the jordan valley uh, a thousand meter descent it was spectacular and we're here because uh, we wanted to uh, demonstrate an act of solidarity with the palestinian people who live in the west bank and can't go and watch the giro in jerusalem because they're not allowed to go through the checkpoints or pass through the separation barrier the wall uh, and we thought that was a great shame and we wanted to just come and bring a bit of the cycling spirit to the West Bank and show the Palestinian people that although the world's media is focused on Jerusalem right now, um, that the rest of the cycling community is, is standing with them in their struggle for freedom. Uh, it's a fantastic place to cycle around the West Bank. Uh, tomorrow we're going to cycle right from the top of the West Bank in Janine uh, down to almost Jerusalem and the day after the south half of the West Bank. And uh, this morning we had a fun ride in Jericho with uh, 50 cyclists, lots of children, boys and girls cycling around the city um, and a real, real positive event. Uh, and there's many keen cyclists here that would love to get a bit of the, the taste of the Giro. And that's what we hope to bring them. So I just thought I'd call in and say hi. I'm really looking forward to the rest of your coverage of the Giro as well. So that was our first or second voice message from Stephen Tunstall. If you've got something to say, a point to make, and we've been getting lots of correspondence in particular about the, the Giro starting here in Israel, um, very mixed, very some of it quite strongly expressed, but um, mm. do do leave your constructive messages there if you'd prefer, and we, we might play them over the next couple of days. We should wrap up for tonight, though, Lionel. We'll be back tomorrow with stage two. Um not expect goes from Haifa to Tel Aviv and will almost certainly be a sprint finish I would have thought looking at it mm-hmm. you would think so um, well that's all for now thank you Lionel let's go and find something to eat thank you Richard <laughs> A 
community around the world. Stories and films with the most compelling characters. The world's finest apparel. Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Rafa.